If you're a veteran to the true crime space like we are, then it goes without saying that you're probably familiar with serial killer Richard Ramirez. And even if you're not, you've more than likely seen the Netflix documentary Night Stalker, The Hunt for a Serial Killer. Richard Ramirez terrorized the city of Los Angeles for a year prior to his arrest in 1989. Known as the Night Stalker, this man would crawl through the windows of his unsuspecting victims. They would then be violated and killed before he would ransack their home for valuables to steal. His victims included the elderly. He was later beaten by a mob of angry civilians in the Boyle Heights neighborhood who identified him as El Matador. I think most humans have in them the capacity to, co to commit murder. Uh, it is no, not because- No, we don't, Richard. Oh, yeah, they, uh, they, they choose not to, not because they are morally superior, as they so commonly claim, but because they are imprisoned in a web of responsibilities, commitments, no, beliefs, and sentiments. Richard, Richard. And that would render murder an absurd gamble or ridiculous well, self-destruction. One of the most bizarre parts to the Richard Ramirez story was his Ted Bundy-esque appeal with the ladies. During his incarceration, he had several fans who wrote to him and visited him in jail. Why were you in the courtroom today? I just wanted to see what he looked like. I think he's cute. He's convicted of 13 murders. I know. <laughs> but he's, he's really a nice guy. One such fan was Doreen Leoy, who later married Ramirez on October 3rd, 1996, inside of California's San Quentin State Prison. The two eventually split, but by the time of his death on June 7th, 2013, Ramirez was again engaged to a 23-year-old writer. But Richard Ramirez wasn't only revered by the ladies, but by a bunch of edgelords as well. One such edgelord was Gregory Scott Hale, or Scott as he liked to call himself, with a K. Scott idolized Ramirez and fantasized about being just like him one day. Scott was born on August 26, 1976, and graduated from Coffee County Central High School in 1995. He went on to have a son who he named Odin. He was the typical guy that you'd see at your local reptile expo or neighborhood ninja store. You know the place, the store in the mall that sells replica swords and glass pipes for tobacco use only. Scott was fascinated with venomous snakes, the occult, knives, and the thrash metal band Slayer. He was a self-proclaimed Satanist, but not in the classical sense. Scott just thought it made him seem cool. After all, Ramirez did the same thing. On his Facebook page, Scott would post bizarre and disturbing messages for attention. He would post things like, I hug people I hate, so I know how big to dig their hole in my backyard. He would frequently talk about cannibalism and pose with snakes and homemade weaponry. The most ridiculous posts of all were the ones where he would fanboy over Richard Ramirez, even going so far as to memorialize his death. This is the type of behavior one might expect from a teenager, not the 37-year-old father that Scott was at the time of our story. Scott managed to hold down a job at Champions Meat Processing for a time, but he was fired after his employer realized that he took the position for nefarious means. He brought home eyeballs, bones, and blood from the slaughtered animals to use in ritualistic manners, as he would put it. Due to this fact that he could no longer make ends meet, Scott was forced to move back home with his parents on Pete Sane Road in Summitville, Tennessee. I wanted to take a quick moment to mention that we're revamping our official Discord server. Whether you want to talk true crime with people just like you, or even take a break and share cat pictures, you'll feel right at home. Discord is a free app you can download on your phone or your computer. Think of it as a cross between a chat room and a message board where you can interact as much or as little as you choose. Click the link below in our pinned comment and come let us know what you thought of today's video. On the evening of Friday, June 8th, 2014, Scott had a chance encounter with a 36-year-old mother of six named Lisa Marie Hyder. The two met at a local liquor store in Manchester, Tennessee, where she worked. Lisa struggled with alcoholism and recently separated from her husband, Charles. The two had lived together in a home in Chattanooga, but split up due to Lisa's drinking problem. She was recently diagnosed with cancer. It is unclear what kind, as some publications mention ovarian, while others mention cervical cancer. Scott offered the mother a ride home, but she was already expecting her ex to come pick her up. It is unclear exactly how, but Scott managed to get Lisa to change her mind. Perhaps she was tired of waiting and just wanted to go home. 
Meanwhile, Charles Hyder, who was still some ways away, was en route to pick up Lisa from work. He called her to let her know he was on the way, but Lisa never answered her phone. Now, Lisa also had another ex-husband who lived in Georgia. So what was even more strange about this fact is that according to that ex-husband, Lisa also called him in the early morning hours and left a voicemail begging for him to come get her. He said when he tried to return the call, there was no answer from Lisa. A familiar trope we see in slasher films began to unfold as they drove. Lisa noticed that Scott was going the wrong way, and he wasn't listening to any of her directions. Finally, Scott told the mother that he needed to make a quick stop at his house before they continued on their way. Scott invited Lisa inside, and at first she was hesitant. It wasn't until he offered her a few drinks, which she couldn't resist. While inside, Scott got his fireplace going and sat down next to Lisa. He poured a round of drinks, and the two sat and talked about their lives. At some point, Scott and Lisa took the party to his bedroom, where things began to get intimate. Afterwards, Lisa fell asleep in Scott's bed. It was at this point that the man decided it was his time to strike. Exactly one year and one day after the anniversary of his idol, Richard Ramirez's death. He was finally going to live out his dream of, in his own mind, being the Night Stalker. Scott got out of bed, retrieved one of his machetes, and launched a savage attack on the mother of six. First, he stabbed her repeatedly with the blade. Then, he began to mutilate her body. He removed her head, hands, and feet, and placed them inside of a plastic bucket. Throughout the process, he took pictures of Lisa's bloody remains. He then carried her torso outside and tossed it inside of his burn pit and set it ablaze. Many publications that I read claim that Scott disembodied Lisa, but I don't think that's exactly what they're trying to get across. Disembodied is defined as being separated from or existing without the body, like that of a ghost. Now, depending on what you believe, I guess it could be factual that Scott did indeed disembody Lisa. But I think that the word that they're looking for is probably disemboweled or dismembered. Lisa's killing filled Scott with what he claimed was a great sense of pleasure. He was proud of his work. It surely brought him back to his days working at the abattoir. But if Lisa's gruesome death wasn't horrific enough, what Scott did next was. Some killers like to keep trophies of their victims as some sort of sick memento. Scott, however, was about to make good on all of this talk about cannibalism. Instead of taking trophies, Scott kept some of Lisa's remains as a reward for killing her. He planned to consume them. Some publications claim that Scott ate parts of Lisa's body during the melee. Mind you, this was all going on in his parents' house. As the liquor store that Lisa worked at surely had surveillance footage, it was probably highly unlikely that Scott was going to get away with his crime. But what he did next sealed the deal. He decided to ask his next door neighbor if he could borrow his digger, which I'm assuming is some sort of tractor. When the neighbor asked what for, Scott didn't make any excuses. Scott told them that he needed to bury a body. As the neighbors already thought that Scott wasn't exactly right in the head, they wasted no time calling 911 to report the crime. According to one neighbor, and I quote, I don't know what to think that this kid I've known for 28 years could do something this gruesome, end quote. Officers quickly descended onto the Hale home and arrested Scott, who was asleep on the couch. He had no choice but to confess. The police found everything. Lisa's mutilated torso in the burn pit and the bucket of parts, even his weapons. Scott was charged with first-degree homicide with an additional charge for abuse of a corpse for the indignities done to Lisa's body. He was held in lieu of a $1.5 million bond. On June 23, 2014, he pled guilty and is currently in the custody of the Morgan County Correctional Complex in Wartburg, Tennessee. He's currently serving a life sentence without the possibility of parole. Despite his crimes, the facilities in which Scott is being housed is classified as minimum restricted. During his stay in prison, Scott managed to acquire an interesting face tattoo akin to Mike Tyson's, except bad. He also made headlines in 2016 after he tried to cash in on his status as a cannibal killer by posting items for sale on the website True Crime Auction House. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the site, 
There's something of an eBay for oddities and true crime murderabilia, as the site calls it. A lot of what they sell is art, and Scott did have some sketches for sale, but he also had something pretty gross, trimmings from his goatee. He listed his signed art for $30 to $35 and his goatee hairs for $95. According to Coffee County District Attorney Craig Northcott, his office was going to look into the laws that could apply to Scott's business venture. He said, quote, this is a first for me and I'm going to have to do some research to what can be done. I'm not sure it's a crime. I do know that there was legislation passed that could prevent any criminal from profiting from his crime. Generally, that's aimed at writing books and things like that, not selling your goatee, end quote. Lisa Marie Hyder was laid to rest on June 21st, 2014. She is survived by her ex-husband, Charles, and children, Amanda, Elizabeth, Christopher, Ricky, and David. Lisa's funeral was held at the Standifer Reed Funeral Home in Dunlop, Texas, officiated by Pastor Chris Boyce and Pastor Kirk Rogers. Although Lisa struggled most of her life with addiction, it doesn't mean she deserved the tragic and gruesome death that she was dealt. She should have gotten the chance to grow old and watch her children become parents. She should have gotten the chance to recover from the demon that is alcoholism. One of her family members described Lisa as a lost soul that her addiction had caused her to drift away from her family in recent years. Even though Lisa had been a bit adrift, they always held out hope that she would turn her life around. According to Lisa's father, Billy Poor, I quote, my daughter was mangled, butchered, and chopped up like a liver, end quote. My daughter should not have been butchered and mangled the way she was. Justice needs to be done here. I want the death penalty, nothing less. Oh God, I want to get this guy so bad, but I know I can't do it. God's going to handle him. Lisa's father is using their family's nightmare to send a message to parents. And these parents need to watch. And these kids need to watch. Don't trust people. Don't go by yourself. According to Dr. Park Dietz, a controversial psychiatrist and serial killer expert, who has interviewed the likes of Ted Kaczynski, Jeffrey Dahmer, Andrea Yates, and Richard Ramirez, among others. Scott ultimately confessed because, in Park Dietz's own words, he wants to be remembered as a notorious criminal. I will quote him, many serial killers admit to comparing their body count to other serial killers and reading books on serial killers. Like anyone else, they have curiosity about people like them. They don't want to feel alone. They want to feel special, but not be the only one, end quote. Scott's final post to Facebook was on June 7th, 2014, the day before he killed Lisa Marie Hyder and the one year anniversary of Richard Ramirez's death. His final post to Facebook was the song Hellion by the band Wasp. The song is about riding motorcycles and listening to heavy metal music, but Scott probably spun it in his head to be something sinister. The chorus of the song reads, Hellion, the devil's hellion child. Hellion will never have to die. Maybe Dr. Dietz was right. Maybe Scott had this planned out all along and thought that he'd be immortalized by his crimes like that of his idol. What do you think? Let us know in our comments section down below.